So let's begin. A few initial thoughts. Oftentimes I hear many questions about what should I include on my resume? What shouldn't I include on my resume? How long should the resume be? So just to kind of get an idea of where to go from there, I always go with what's called R and R. So generally speaking, only include what is recent. That's the first R. So that's approximately 10 years. The second R is what's relevant to the position. So if you ask yourself, is this item recent and is it relevant, then maybe you do go on to page two only after you've lowered the font size, say between 10 to 12, you've decreased your margins, and again, if you go on to page two, then so be it. And if that's the case, if the resume is over one page, you can include a header on subsequent pages or simply list the first initial of your name, your last name, and then page two. So let's begin with the top of the resume, certainly the header. So here we have Edward Hand Valen. Start off with our name, our location, so city and state. If we're leaving our resume on a database, some folks are not comfortable leaving that type of information there. It's okay not to include it if you're leaving it on a database. That's just personal choice. Certainly adding a phone number, we definitely need to have that. An email address that is appropriate, and we can see at least with this example that they've branded their email address to their name. That's terribly important because it's professional and it's easy for an employer to look up based on the name. The last piece of information in the header would be the LinkedIn public profile address. If you're not on LinkedIn, I highly suggest getting on there as it gives us unprecedented access to information, job postings, employers, and the like. So with this, when we cre first create our LinkedIn account, this address is going to be long. There's going to be letters and numbers, a bunch of information that's not properly branded. What we do is go in and click on the blue circles or the blue pens and edit this information. In this case, Edward has branded it to his last name and it looks very similar to his email. So there's continuity between both sources. What we have as well on the right hand side, many of us might be aware that this is a QR code. So this is short for quick response code. Now, some of this has fallen out of favor. If you talk to some folks in human resources, some know what it is and might be interested in scanning it with a barcode reader from a smartphone. Others may not be interested, but I think it might have a little bit of interest on some people's part because it's different. And I think that's what's important sometimes about resumes because in the end, we need to stand out. So moving forward from the header, we'll look at the first type of the three resumes. This is the entry level early career resume. This this is generally what's called a reverse chronological format, and this is the most preferred by employers simply because they can see where you developed your skills by employer, beginning with most recent first. So after we've identified ourselves, the first category is generally the objective. There's a couple different ways to play this. The first example is if we're applying for a position, we know the job title, we know the employer, you can customize it highly to that employer in that position. So the suggestion would be position as, insert the job title from the posting with, and then insert the employer name. Now there are a number of implications here. First of which is this resume can go to no one but that employer for that job. Now the other implication is that if we use this technique, we do have to go in and change it each time. It's highly specific and it can appear, appear genuine to an employer simply because of that. The second case, this is a reasonable objective to use if we want to leave our resume on a database. In this case, we say position in the field of, and then we insert the degree we're pursuing or the field that we're interested in. It's specific enough that the employer will know where you want to go, but it's not so specific that you have to go into the database and change it. The third type is what we do in terms of, actually it's what they call a cold application. Maybe you have an employer in mind, you've looked them up online, you've looked in, on indeed.com to see if they have any postings whatsoever and they don't. 
but you still want to try and find out if something's available that's not posted. Based on your research, you may understand that there are a few skills that they require in their positions that you have. So in that case, you might use this third example, position utilizing and then insert a few of the skills that you have that you know that they need. So moving from the objective, we hit education. So in this case, certainly want to state the institution, city and state, state the degree, and then for those of us who have not graduated, we want to do a comma, expected, and then insert the month and the year that you plan to graduate. And that gives an employer a ballpark figure as to when you'll finish up. The next line lists GPA. Now there are oftentimes questions about this. The general rule of thumb is if your GPA is 3.0 or higher, include it on your resume. But we can also split this up. In some cases, our major GPA might be higher than our cumulative GPA simply because we enjoyed the core coursework that much more and excelled as a result. So can you put major GPA if it's above three? Absolutely. If we have room on the resume, we can have subcategories under education, the first of which we'll call coursework. And the rule of thumb here is we can list up to three different courses on each side. This way you have six. You haven't taken up too many lines. But the point here too is we need to be conversant with what we learned in each of those classes. Because if an employer does ask, we need to be prepared to answer. Second category within education is special projects. So in this case, if you've done group work, if you've done presentations, if you've conducted research and submitted a report as a part of class, you can list that here. And that would go under a simple category title like special projects. So moving from education, we come to related experience. Now will we all have this category title? No. And that's okay. If we have related experience, that's terrific because it's related to the objective. If we don't have related experience, all you'll have to do is just list work experience as the category title. As we go through the information, there's a couple things we definitely have to have. The job title, the month, as well as years of employment. And we can see that this is listed to present. You want to have the name of the employer and then the city and state. We don't need the street address, the phone number, or the zip code. Sometimes folks will include that. Uh, that's not something we have to, to offer up. So looking at this, uh, what's I think you know industry standard is the use of bullet points. It tends to be easier to read rather than paragraphs. And here we can see that they've been particular. Notice the present tense, provide, collect, tabulate, administer. All of the verbs are in present tense. Why? Because this individual currently works there. And present tense verbs read faster than past tense. What they've done, too, is quantified information in their bullet points. Anything you can quantify on your resume, you definitely want to do so. If it's a percentage increase, the amount of money you've handled as part of a position, if that's appropriate to share, the number of people you've trained, all of that stuff is fair game. Going further with this bullet, we have an acronym. Now, if you're concerned about acronyms and you do, you're not sure if your audience will know what that means, definitely spell it out. So in this case, this is Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. And if I think they're not going to know what that means on the receiving end, I'll spell it out. Now, this is interesting in terms of the bullet point. There's one word that takes up an entire line. I call this one word greedy. What I would do is go back through and see if I could amend some of the phrasing so that this term, interventions, comes back up on the second line. That would save me a line. A quick fix, maybe, not in this case, but you can always insert an ampersand for the term and. That'll save you two characters. Something to think about. Other than that, the rest of the information seems pretty straightforward. And there's no real list or rule, rather, in terms of how many bullet points you should have. Two for this one, three for that one, one for this one. 
whatever works in terms of how you've represented your experience is the most important. So moving on from related experience, we have the category other experience. Now we can see right off the bat what? They've not gone into detail simply because other experience is unrelated to what? The objective. The good thing about this position is that they've done it for a few years, so it gives an employer a sense of work history, but this is the main player right here. So they were a ride attendant, and that might not seem like too much responsibility, but in terms of volume, they interact with 100 plus riders per shift. That's a lot. And again, we always want to try and quantify it. So moving from other experience, we can look at the other categories that are available to us. Computer skills, technical skills can be a category. Be as particular as possible. If you list Microsoft Office, I don't suggest then listing Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Publisher, that type of thing. If you list Microsoft Office, it's understood that you mean the suite of services, of software. So something to consider there as well. Another category, activities. Now we've got the warning sign here, right? Two categories we generally do not include on the resume, religion and politics, especially if it's unrelated to the job. There's three ways to kind of approach this subject. The first is the most conservative, and that's not to list anything related to religion or politics because folks have internal biases, whether they're aware of them or not, uh, sometimes they act on them. The second way to approach religion or politics on the resume is to be non-denominational. So in the case of religion, I may say something like uh, volunteer at spiritual center and describe that experience there. Third way, and this is fairly rare, I haven't seen much of this in, uh, in, in years and years, uh, where someone lists both either their religious or political affiliations as a way to filter out employers who they do not want to work with because they're not interested in working with someone who doesn't share the same beliefs. Another category title we can include, language skills. Now do you have to be fluent in a language in order to list it on your resume? Absolutely not. So in this case, I might say conversational Spanish. I didn't say I was fluent, I just gave an idea. I might say something else like intermediate understanding of German. So there's other ways to kind of qualify your understanding of languages. Another category, volunteerism. If space permits, you should format your volunteerism the same way you formatted work experience. So you'll list as job title volunteer, the dates you volunteered underneath the job title, list the name of that institution, the employer, and across from that, the city and state where that location is. And then maybe bullet point a few of the things that you did. Now this is pretty cool. According to a 2011 LinkedIn survey, one in five hiring managers agree to hiring someone based on their volunteer experience. So if you have volunteerism, and you haven't made room for it on the resume, I recommend doing your best format-wise to institute that information. Last category, and again, this is the entry-level resume. We're listing references. So generally, we'll say references available upon request. Now, who can references be? They can be past or present employers, past or present faculty, and staff. And generally speaking, how many references should you have? The suggestion there would be to have three. So let's take a look at the resume as a whole. And we'll stop here for a second, take a look, and we invite any questions that you might have with regard to format and content on this version. OK, so let's take a look. We have a few questions. Uh, for the job descriptions, could it be possible to state at least five points instead of three? Is there a limit? No, I don't think that there is a limit as long as they don't get too long-winded. Uh, five bullet points seems reasonable. If you feel that that represents your experience well enough, absolutely, that's cool. When we say is there a limit, when we ask that, 
When you start getting into 10, 12, 15 bullet points, I would suggest inserting functional categories, so grouping the bullets together by function. And this way you can separate them out and it's not a whole bunch of bullet points together. Uh, will this be available on the website? We will archive this workshop and I thank you for that question, it makes me feel good. So with that, uh, we will archive this on our YouTube channel and that's uh, MSU, career, MSU Career Workshops. It should be available within a couple days, maybe not too long. Is there a service where I can bring my resume in? Absolutely. If you have a pen or a pencil, I would definitely write this web address down. So this is our main page, montclair.edu slash career services. And once there, you'll see in the center of the page, it says designated career advisor. Click on that, and based on your major, you'll find your career advisor. Definitely meet with them. Set an appointment, bring your resume in, and sit down with them. And then the last question for this section, uh, should education go first because degree not yet completed? It's okay if, edu if for the version that we're looking at now, uh, the entry level, we can see here that, yeah, I haven't, I haven't earned my degree yet, and it should go at the top because I think to myself, this degree generally draws more attention than would be my experience here. But once this experience grows and expands, this information is going to go up here, and then as we'll see in a few more slides, education is going to end up down there. And that's generally for folks, you know, they may, they may have been out of school for six years, eight years, generally speaking. And I hope that helps. And I know we have other questions. We'll get to those at the end. Uh, and again, I thank you for your questions, and we'll continue here. So the second type of resume that we'll look at, uh, this is what we're saying is somebody who is mid-career, who has developed experience. And what I'll share with you at this point is a format called functional format. Now we've got thumbs down and we've got thumbs up. The reason for that is most employers do not like a functional format because they do not know where an individual developed their skills. And you'll see later on what that means. Now why would I mention functional format if it's not preferred? It's because some people like to use this for two reasons. The first reason somebody uses a functional format is if they have gaps in employment. The second reason is if somebody is making a career transition. So here, what's missing based on the reverse chronological example we looked at for the entry level? There's no objective. They start off right off the bat with a category called summary. And here, the summary itself should be a snapshot. If we think of a summary in terms of films, what would that be? This would be the trailer. You want to get people interested so that later on they're going to follow through and read the rest of the information. So it's an overview. It's a snapshot. We can see the number of years experience someone had. They talk about being a trusted associate, walking, working across different teams, and then they list technical skills. So they do not separate out whereas in the previous resume version did, separate skills. So moving from the summary, we don't go anywhere near education, right? That's going to fall at the end. So this is the following category, and it's different. You can see right away. So the category title here is Selected Career Highlights. And what this individual has done is drawn highlights that they're most proud of from any of their jobs in the past and place them in one category. So a couple things that seem to stand out here. They quantified some information. They talked about a lot of different logistics, relocation, transitioning from paper-based to engineer, engineering files to digital files. So it says a lot in a short period of time. The only thing I think that could be different is bullet three directed all facets of annual company-wide sales conference. Well, how many people came? Was it a big conference? Was it a small conference? I don't know. 
but I think it could be better represented if they quantified the number of individuals who attended. So going from selected career highlights, areas of impact, another category title that can be used on a functional type resume. So in this one, chosen as corporate headquarters site liaison, acted as first point of contact for visitors at all levels. I'm getting a lot of information in a short amount of time. Management experience, compiling reports, drafting confidential correspondence, that type of thing. So again, these are areas not so much about the previous one, about the highlights, these are areas where they can immediately hit the ground running and provide service to the employer. Moving from this category, oh, what's that? Work history. See how brief it is? They don't draw attention to it because, again, these are folks who have had either gaps in employment or who are work making a career transition. They don't want to draw attention to this category, so they put it at the bottom and they keep it brief. So the name of the employers, the job title, the dates of employment, and then the next, name of employer, city and state job title, and so on. So in this case, Jeeves Learning Center, Edison, New Jersey, job title, and so on. And what category do you think will be at the next? Education, right? So that's at the bottom. This individual has been out for a while. So in this case, you might insert that month and year. They still you know, don't have any problem representing it. Honors that they had as well as you know, while they were in school, and then they call it a day. So let's take a look at the, this type of resume, the functional resume, in its entirety. So we'll pause here for a second, and you know, we welcome your questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. Okay, so we have a few questions for this section. Do you have to be an expert in order to list certain computer skills? It's a good question. Along with what we did with language skills, you can qualify them. So you can say basic understanding of uh, Pro Tools, basic understanding of Photoshop, intermediate understanding of Microsoft Word. So if you're concerned about it, you can definitely qualify those things. Or can you have basic skills? Sure. What I might do is you can. Uh, the, your best friend here, uh, in addition to the resume, is what? It's the cover letter. So we can always use that as a way to kind of describe our experience in a way that puts us in a greater light. Uh, what if your experience in your position exceeds one page? It may. Uh, the first two things I would do in order to keep it to one is to lower the font size, and the lowest font size generally is 10. And then I would decrease my margins. I've seen things you know, down to about 0.6 all the way around, and that is still printable. So those would be two things I would do initially. Okay. Um, could it be possible to still have a three-page resume that is attractive? Uh, that having been said, I'd have to see it. And I'm not being silly about it, because one of the things we definitely don't want to do is have any sense of redundancy. We've spoken with employers and they don't want to be told or read uh, anything that might be duplicative. And again, too, we want to go with R&R. What's recent? Generally, information that's 10 years, approximately 10 years. And then the other R is what's relevant to the position. So if I'm asking, is it recent, is it relevant, and I'm saying no, then that information I'm not going to include on the resume. Another question, uh, what should I write on my resume if I can read and write in another language but not speak it? That's an interesting one. So I might say something like, be, I would be very straightforward about it, ability to read and write and then insert the language. To qualify it by, not, by saying I can't speak it, I don't want to get into any negatives, any perceived negatives about an inability or perceived inability on a resume, so I would stick with what's positive. Again, that would be ability to read and write blank language. A couple more. 
uh, when writing about experiences, should it all be in pre present tense? Good question. So when I write about my experience where I currently work, those verbs should be in present tense. When I'm listing verbs, or writing verbs rather, where I no longer work, those should be in past tense. It's what they call parallel grammar structure. Another question, why is only work history and education centered? Great question. Great question. So if, if we look at this category, or if we look at this resume, um, summary is centered, selected career highlights are centered, and these types of things, this is a different vibe than the previous resume examples. So everything's centered, whereas the reverse chronological, they had summary over here, selected highlights over here, right? There's no one hard, fast rule that says you can't, that you have to have them left aligned or, or centered. I like them in the center because I think it gives it a different look. Uh, for education, are we only supposed to write the college university we attended? How far back would they want it? So we generally only list institutions where we receive degree. And if we received an associate's, that's the same degree, like an associate's in psychology or liberal arts, and then we pursue a BA in liberal arts, we're not going to mention the associate's because when we come to Mockler State or other institution where that degree is accepted, all of those credits are subsumed by, at the bachelor's level. So we're not going to reiterate that information. Uh, how far back do we go? There's the old rule, I mean, generally 10 years, and that, that applies to education as well. So could this format also be used for students who are recent grads and feel that this would provide a better summary of their previous work experience? Could it work? It's possible. Is it a risk? Somewhat. That's something you definitely have to take into consideration as we know employers are not really fans of the functional format. I hope that helps. Okay. So let's move on. This is the third and final resume example we'll look at. So this is an individual who's, who's got considerable experience. With this, number one, we, see, we do not see an objective. We do not even see the term summary. They absolutely put out right at the top who it is that they are. Director of accounting slash controller. They're not asking. They're being very forthright in telling you what it is that they've done and what they can do going forward. And again, rather than wasting a line and seeing summary, they get right into it. They don't state a summary because at this stage of the game, it's assumed that this is a summary and doesn't need to be listed. Looking at this as well, the same principles apply. This is a trailer. It's meant for us to kind of continue to read through we want to be entertained and see more. So, again, this is an individual with considerable employment history, and this is the way they, they represent this experience. So just like anything else, they mention the employer. In this case, it's Plaka Manufacturing. We've got city and state, and the month and year that they were employed. But this is where it gets good. Now we've got an italicized description of the employer. It's about a line and a half, and this does many, many different things. Number one, this gives us context. So if I was to read this and say, Plaka Manufacturing, if I'm not aware of who they are, I don't really know. But if I'm given this, okay, 1946, this is a family-owned organization that was started generally right after World War II. They've been around for a while. They're entering the global marketplace. So what's implied there? They're a moving company. They're on their way up, continuing up. And then this is their annual revenue. Considerable. So now I've got this context. As I read next, I see job title. And briefly, they describe their responsibilities, their work experience here. That's it. It's a brief paragraph. But what's different about this is that they have a subcategory. Most folks don't use this. I definitely suggest using this. If you have accomplishments associated with your position, rather than hide them within the description of the position, give them their own subcategory and then outline them here. 
So here we can see that they quantified profits, what it is that they'd earned. We can see that they were recognized as an individual in their position, in, in this case cost accounting. And I can also see that they were a member of a team. So I know that they can work well by themselves as well as on a team. So taking from this overall example of employment history, two things anybody can do to their resume, whether they've, they're entry level, mid, or if they're experienced, is they can use this italicized description right underneath the employer. It's an easy, easy way to do Look at the, the, your employer's mission, look at their vision, look at how they describe themselves. So what I might list, say, I might have Montclair State University, Montclair, New Jersey, list the months and years, and then here in italicize, I might mention something like, um, you know, Montclair State offers 300 majors, minors, and concentrations ranging from the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral level. You know, something along the line, those lines to give them a sense of context, what the institution's all about. Second largest, fastest growing institution of higher education in New Jersey. All that stuff's fair game. And then the second thing again, too, is anybody, regardless of their experience, they can use this accomplishment subcategory. So moving on, same thing, employment history. In this case, it's continued. We've got the name of the employer, Crab, Fay, and Beagle. These guys are CPAs. And we've got the italicized description of the employer there. So again, I get a sense of context. Job title, month and year, all the same stuff we've looked at. Brief, very brief description of responsibilities. And then, you know, we got to let people know that we have accomplishments. We're going to list them there. That having been said, is there any time to be humble on the resume? Not necessarily, because if we think about it, the job search is about competition. So while we might be humble and we're not comfortable sharing all of what it is that we've done that's positive, some other job seekers might not have any problem sharing that information, and that might help them more so. So think about it this way. You don't want to be humble necessarily. You want to be assertive. Share your accomplishments. It's crucial to getting into that interview. So continuing on from employment history, these are two categories that anybody can use, but we're using them here for the experienced level. So civic engagement, that's another way to say volunteerism. That's another way of saying, um, you know, you give back to your community. So with this, we treat it just like work employment in terms of format. So employer name, city and state, and in this case job title is volunteer, because I'm civic, right? I give back. Okay. Okay. So here's a couple categories. Maybe there was a little bit lag there. So hopefully we're all caught up. So two categories we can take advantage of, civic engagement and this relates to volunteerism. The other relates to, say, career development. So rather than saying a category like training, you can use the term career development to represent that. So, you know, in some ways it sounds a little bit nicer. And then next, we can list those actual trainings and you know, the exams that we may have passed that an employer would like to see. Just working on a little thing over here, no biggie. Uh, the next category that we'll look at after civic engagement and career development, for those of us who are on our mobile devices, is education. And we know that this is listed at the bottom simply because they've been out of uh, school for quite some time. They still want to represent their experience. And in this case, we can see here too, Okay, so we list the education, but what's missing from this description of education? 
and it's symbolic of this pair of scissors. What is it that's missing? It's their date of graduation because as we talked about before, some people are biased. Whether it's religion or politics, there's also biases against people's ages. So to remove that, some people feel that there's ageism out there and they want to remove it simply because they want to try and get around that and that's completely understandable. So moving forward from there, let's take a look at the big picture of this resume. And again, we invite your questions, so we'll look at this and take your questions as we go along. Okay. All right. So we're taking questions, and we're catching up on a few of the other slides, so we'll start here. If my associates is, great question, if my associates is different than my bachelor's, is it okay to mention? Yes, because it's not a duplicative degree, you definitely want to mention your associates if it's different. It gives an employer a sense of scope. There may be knowledge that you gained in your associates program that's helpful to him or her going forward. How should I list leadership experience, like being on a township board or a political can candidate or FEMA certificates? That's cool. I like that. It's different. You can even have a separate category and call it leadership experience, and you can list that affiliation. And in terms of format, I would format it in the very same way you format employment. So the job title that you had, or you know, if you were a freeholder in this case, you are, were a treasurer for an organization, we're going to list that. The name of the institution or the board, city and state dates, and then bullet point a little bit about what you did. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, FEMA certificates, I might put that under career development as a category title. Or if you're more comfortable with that, you can always use uh, certifications as a separate category title and list those. Yeah. Yeah, these are good questions. Let's see, we got a couple more. I have a lot of internships and volunteer experience. Can I add it all? Or should I just pull from the last two or three years? That's a good question, too. It's tough to answer without seeing it. Uh, but what you might want to do is group this information. So group the volunteer experience and then list all of those. And then group the internships and list all of those, beginning with most recent first and then working your way back. This way it doesn't look like, um, you know, here's the internship, here's the volunteerism, here's another the volunteerism, here's the internship. So it's not specific to date order because you're using separate category titles. I'm an experienced IT professional. I've been doing help get desk support for many years. However, I'm interested in the position above what I'm normally in. How do I stress that on my resume? Well, I think it's important to be as straightforward as possible on the resume, but in this case, uh, what I would stress this on is on the cover letter. So the cover letter, again, that's, that's you know one of those things not many folks use, but could. So with that, I would use that as a way to not only express my ability to write, but express why I think that I'm qualified for a position that requires greater responsibility. Uh, another one, I have eight years experience in IT, but I'm just getting my degree. Which format should I use? Now that's cool. I wouldn't mind seeing that resume. Hmm. I might be tempted to use a summary at the top in your experience so you can list the degree and then comma expected but not in a traditional education format so list and talk about the, those eight years or so and then within that mention that you're about to receive your degree in IT hopefully that helps uh, a couple others is this last format similar to a CV where well, you guys are answer, asking great questions so uh, to answer you directly, no. Uh, the, the best way to put that is this is a one-page resume for Edward Han Valen. A CV is curriculum vita, which is Latin for life story. So CVs can be as long as the day. And I, sometimes folks will call them the kitchen sink. They could be pages and pages and pages of information. So uh, to answer you directly, no, this is not uh, a CV. 
CVs are typical uh, for higher education. Uh, oftentimes folks will refer to CVs uh, in the UK, uh, sometimes in Europe, that kind of thing, uh, but generally in the States we'll call them uh, resumes. Uh, can I say civic engagement instead of volunteerism if I'm using a reverse chronological format resume? Straightforward question, the answer is yes. Should I only list the volunteer experience if it's related to the position I'm looking to obtain? Whether the volunteerism is related or not, I would do my darndest to make space for that volunteerism because you never know what an employer's interests are outside of work. So they may be interested in an area of volunteerism that's near and dear to them that you list. And next thing you know, you've got a conversation going, and that makes a connection. Okay, so let's move on. Again, great questions out there. So this is very important. I would definitely write this down if you have a pen. This website, it's called JobScan, and this is not a typo. There is no M. So it's jobscan.co, and we talk about how do I tailor my resume to what the employers are looking for. Well, this website is in part your answer, and in some ways it's an answer to what some folks will call the black hole, where people apply over and over online and they never hear anything back. The reason being is a lot of companies use what they call an ATS, this is what they call an applicant tracking system. So if you ever see, you know, on the website that you're in, it says ICIMS, I-C-I-M-S, or Taleo, T-A-L-E-O, you know that you're inside of an ATS. What I would do is use JobScan prior to applying. So what you do, incidentally, this site was featured on Lifehacker. This is some pretty cool stuff. So you copy and paste your resume on this side minus any contact information, because we all know the internet can be a weird place. The next step is to copy and paste the job description from the employer. What you do at that point is you hit scan, and it comes up with a list of keywords that have either matched the job description or keywords that are missing. What's very helpful, too, is it'll give you a percentage match in that report between your resume and the job description. With JobScan, the suggestion here is that you want to at least get in the 80s or higher in terms of percentage match with the resume and the job description. So what are the implications? Why do we do this before applying? So we could see what might be missing. And if we're honest with ourselves and we see that things are missing and we do have those qualities, we do have those skills, what we want to do is, before we apply, change the summary to reflect those skills. Change the bullet points to reflect those skills that are missing, and then apply. And hopefully at that point, we're much more likely to make it through the applicant tracking system and have a human read our resume. So just about to finish up, definitely follow us. You know, Check us out online, social media. We're on Twitter, obviously, LinkedIn, Facebook. You can see our information there, hashtag MSU Career Serve, slash MSU Career Center for LinkedIn, and slash Red Hawk Careers for Facebook. Uh, definitely stay connected. We've got a lot of stuff going on, and uh, we definitely want to keep in touch with you. Uh, that having been said, with social media, we want to look at this quote. According to the Society for Human Resource Management, 77% of employers are Googling job seekers. So the implications there are huge. Uh, one of the things you definitely want to do is exercise every possible privacy feature in your social media account as possible. So that would be one. The secondary one would be if 77% of employers are Googling us as job seekers, that means the majority of the time our first interview occurs without us even knowing it. All the more reason for our internet footprint to be professional. And probably the easiest way to do that is to have a great LinkedIn profile. So that having been said, we're about to finish up, uh, but we're going to now begin answering any final questions uh, for tonight's presentation. Okay, a couple more questions before we finish up. 
is it okay to make the job description within the cover letter or to to match the job description with the cover letter as well or will that website uh, will, will that website only match the resume that's right. <laughs> so with this um, we definitely want the cover letter again that similar to the summary we want that to be like a trailer give them the information so that they want to read the resume so if we look at it here too when we meet an employer what's the first thing we do we give them a handshake right so our handshake introduces us the cover letter is like a handshake in that it introduces us to the employers by way of uh, and in the end the resume so how do I stand out on the cover letter the best way to do that is to insert a paragraph about the employer. So we want to look at their mission, their history, their products. What I would do, I would go to their LinkedIn page if they have one, and I would look through their news feed. What is it that they're posting? What type of content are they suggesting that's important to them? And in that paragraph on my cover letter, I might say something like, I realize some of the concerns you face relate to, and then I would explain that subject matter by way of the LinkedIn profile. It's a good way to start that paragraph quickly. So writing about them is probably one of the best ways to get noticed because most folks do not do it. Most cover letters begin with, you know, every paragraph begins with I and I'm a perfect candidate and all this information. Uh, to stand out, I think, would be to talk about them. Not only because it's about them, but because it shows that you've done research on them. Other than that, we want to look at other webinars that we'll do, and we are planning, if there's interest out there, uh, doing a webinar on how to write an effective cover letter. Yeah, if you're interested, uh, by all means, uh, type that into the uh, into the pane there, and we'll we'll take note of it for the as we go forward. Uh, and then maybe finally is the last question. Is it okay to list career-related memberships under education due to lack, lack of space? That's a good question. Um, if the memberships are related to school or related to the degree, and again, we're just looking for space, I think it might work. It's tough for me to really say definitively without seeing it. But again, if it relates to the degree, then I might be able to slip it in there. But as a subcategory, uh, I might hit tab and then say memberships and then list them as they relate. Okay, thank you everyone for attending tonight's webinar, Red Hawk Resumes Stand Out. Tonight's webinar was recorded and will soon be archived on our YouTube channel at MSU Career Workshops. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation. Please provide your feedback as this will help us improve our services. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Be sure to take advantage of career services and have a great evening.